Today we're really excited to have Russell with us. Um, he is the author of The Island in, at the Center of the World, Gospel of Truths and Saints and Mad Men. He's also written for JQ, The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, and a ton of other publications. So um, we're really excited to have him here today. He came all the way from Amsterdam, where he currently lives. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming him here today. Thank you, Amber. Thank you all. Thank you very much. I didn't come directly from Amsterdam, actually. I was in New York first. And, um, so my name is Russell Shorto, and the book is called Descartes' Bones, and it's actually a uh, terribly descriptive title. It is about the bones of the French philosopher René Descartes, which is, as you would imagine, a very small, specific story. Um, but it's also, as I'll get into in a minute, uh, metaphorical and it's about other things. It's really about the whole sweep of the modern centuries. So the challenge as, as a writer was how to balance these two things uh, the, in, in terms of a narrative. This, this very small delicate story uh, that kind of winds its way through uh, three and a half centuries and this other story which gets into you know the development of science and the French Revolution and the development of democracy and and I, I, and early on, I used as my, I used myself as a guide, thinking, all right, as a reader, I walk into a bookshop. If I saw a book lying on the table called Descartes' Bones, I would pick it up. Maybe everybody wouldn't, but I would pick it up. <laughs> and if it were, you know, 800 pages long, I would pick it up. I would read the back cover, and then I would, you know, put it down. And, but if it were, and this is, I remember saying for some reason, 240 pages. If it were 240 pages long. I would pick it up, I would buy it, and I'd read it in a weekend. So I just actually looked, and the text itself comes at 253 pages. So I think, you know, I, I, I kind of hit my mark, I guess. Um, but anyway, so in talking about it, I think it's sort of the same balancing act. So how much am I talking about the smaller story and, and how much uh, about the larger events? So um, the book just came out yesterday, so I'm, uh, this is actually only my second talk on it, so you're sort of guinea pigs to, in, in terms of uh, how I approach things. Um, very briefly, I'll just say a couple things about myself for people who are interested in those sorts of things. Um, I'm, I was born and raised in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, which is famous for the Johnstown flood of 1889. And uh, since I write um, narrative history, I often have thought that if David McCulloch had not written his first book about the Johnstown flood, and it was a you know, definitive book on the topic, that would have been a natural topic for me. Uh, but uh, that's, it wasn't to be. I went to George Washington University and I studied philosophy and journalism as we were just talking about at lunch, which and, and people in both departments came to me and said, this combination doesn't make sense. What do you what do you think you're gonna do with this? And it occurs to me now that I would like to take this book and walk up to them and say, This is <laughs> this is what I had in mind, you know. <laughs> which is not, you know, I mean that's not the book is not journalism, but um, I have I write journalism, I write for the New York Times. Um, and I write history, and it occurs to me often that the two things are similar. In fact, a, a friend of mine, a historian who's a, a little meek woman, uh, said to me once that she wanted to be a journalist, but she was very shy. She was too shy to talk to living people. So I guess her definition is, you know, history is journalism with dead people. So, um, so there's, a, there's a certain overlap in the two fields. The last book I wrote was called The Island at the Center of the World. It came out in 2004, and it was about the Dutch founding of Manhattan, of, of the Dutch colony of New Netherland, which was based on Manhattan with the capital of New Amsterdam. And the argument that I made in that book was that um, the history, American history, has looked at this uh, Dutch colony as being very, uh, really inconsequential, the, this sort of you know, image of, cartoonish image of these little pink Dutchmen with their clay pipes waddling around until the British took over and renamed it New York and history really got going. Uh, in fact, it was, a, it was quite a consequential uh, place and the argument that I make is that because the Dutch uh, provinces in the 17th century were the melting pot of Europe, the, the Dutch at the time developed this notion of tolerance as a way to, as a kind of social glue and that came with them. And that then uh, allowed New York to develop as an immigrant society from the beginning and, a pla and it allowed it to develop very different from Boston, for example. And, uh, and that because New York became what it did, it had a wider impact on the country. So I was researching that book and uh, there is a guy, uh, a man 
who uh, I think of as kind of the unheralded uh, father of New York City, a Dutchman named Adrian Vanderdam, <coughs> who, um, st who trained at Leiden University, which was kind of the Harvard of the, of the, the low countries in the 17th century and still is. Uh, and this was a time in the 1630s at the birth of the modern, when in, uh, in history and in law, the, it was the beginning of ideas about individual rights and, in fact, of the, the concept of, a na of nation states and their, their territorial jurisdiction and so on. And so I was researching this figure, Adrian Vanderdonk, in Leiden at the time. And uh, it, uh, I discovered that Rene Descartes was there as kind of the reigning intellectual celebrity of the, uh, of the, the faculty. And um, when, I, when I studied philosophy at university, it was presented very much as sort of this conversation across the centuries. You know, Plato says this and Descartes answers that and, and John Dewey responds this, never mind that there's centuries in between these, these things. Uh, which was, you know, when I was 19, it was a, it's, a, it's a very intense, interesting way to sort of think about things. But it also leaves something out. And of course, what it leaves out is the development of ideas in real time, in history, among, as, as coming, uh, coming uh, from conflicts between real people. So there, on the one hand, discovering Descartes in this very real historical setting uh, was, was interesting to me. But also, um, I came across this odd reference to the fact that 16 years after he died uh, in Sweden, his bones were dug up and people began taking pieces of him. And um, I, for whatever you know, personal Id idiosyncrasies, this attracted me, this idea. Um, <laughs> And uh, I left it because I was busy, and then I just came back and did a little exploring, and then went away and came back again. And um, after, I think after a while, as a writer, you learn to trust your instincts. Like if something stays with you, and not this doesn't uh, apply only in writing, of course, but if something stays with you, you start to think, well, maybe there's something other than you know sheer weirdness that's 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 appealing here, and maybe it's worthwhile. So I um, stayed with it, and, and I discovered that, in fact, the, the story has this kind of metaphorical uh, import that, that, in fact, is quite relevant right down to, to today. Um, and that's why I decided I really wanted to spend time with this. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, Descartes was born in 1596, and he died in 1650. And at, in that time frame, his, his life very neatly encompasses this period at the birth of the modern when people were, uh, like William Harvey and Francis Bacon and Galileo, were doing all of this exuberant experimentation, grinding lenses and looking through microscopes and, and telescopes and, and getting at sort of, you know, the fabric of, of the material world and, and trying to comprehend it and causing a lot of consternation because what they were doing didn't fit within the framework of scholastic knowledge, which had been built up over the previous millennium or so, uh, w in which things were grounded in, um, among, uh, uh, most importantly, grounded in the biblical precepts. Uh, at the same time, the work that they were doing was scattered. It was random. It ha didn't have a, a foundation. And Descartes, in essence, what he did was provide the intellectual foundation for modernity. He, his uh, most renowned book was a little 58-page <laughs> essay called uh, Discourse on, uh, for Rightly Conducting the Reason. Um, a Discourse on the Method for Rightly Conducting the Reason. It's a, actually a longer title than that. Um, and uh, he, this was kind of a shot heard around the world. For it, it wasn't a bestseller at the time, but the people who bought it were the people who, who mattered and who were doing things and who saw it as a reorientation, of, as, as the kind of uh, foundation that they wanted, that they, they felt they needed. So within his lifetime, he suddenly became this focus of attention. And then, after his life, after his death, he became a new focus of attention. One of the things that's interesting to me about this period in history is that there was a deep uh, confusion over what in f what over the foundations of knowledge, what kind of basis, uh, uh, where to sort of where to sink the, your pilings. Um, Descartes was, of course, an investigator into the natural world, like Bacon and Galileo and others. He was, uh, and one of the ironies in, in his uh, 
life, you know, historical figures all get kind of um, uh, uh, truncated. They get shortened into little boxes of, you know, a couple of sentences that we know, this is how we know George Washington or, or whoever. Uh, and Descartes it, it go, has gone down in history very much as this uh, almost personification of disembodied intellect. You know, even his name, Cartesian coordinates and Cartesian dualism, these are very abstract notions. Uh, and the irony is that at, at the time he was like uh, Galileo and Francis Bacon and uh, Constantine Huygens and others. He was uh, very focused on the natural world. In fact, he was, and there, and there are a lot of ironies in this topic of Descartes' bones, focusing on his actual bones, one of which is he always saw his principal focus being medicine. He wanted to <coughs> cure disease. And in particular, he was interested in his own body. He, when he was a child, he was very sickly. His parents assumed he would die young, and they told him that. Uh, and, he, um, and then he left home to go to a, a boys' school. And from that moment, maybe not coincidentally, he started to do better. And, uh, and so then medicine became a principal preoccupation for him. And uh, so much so that he, he thought, you know, in this very naive way they had then, that he would be, a, that the body was kind of, uh, there was a code to it. And when you found it, you could sort of flip a switch and increase the human lifespan almost, um, almost uh, uh, infinitely. And in fact, he said, in one, in one letter he said that uh, he planned, it, planned to do this if he were not, quote, prevented by the brevity of life. And it's not clear if he were, you know, if he was making a joke there or not. But after he died, in fact, some peop many people believed that he was, he was going to uh, make, make good on this. And after he died, people were surprised that he could die. You know, the person who was uh, going to discover immortality would die. Um, so, the, so there's this nice irony in that uh, this figure who is known for abstraction was, in fact, originally focused on flesh and bones, including, including his own flesh and bones. When he turned 40, his hair started to turn gray, and he wanted to you know, find a way to reverse the graying process. So, um, the, uh, the larger irony in this story is that Descartes is, among other things, the inventor, or, or, or we could credit or blame him with this, uh, what is the central modern dilemma, the conflict between faith and reason and where to put, where to put our ultimate, uh, you know, our ultimate base. Um, and as it turns out, his bones were subject to this same split, the same conflict. His, uh, uh, after he died in 1666, people in Paris uh, decided that they wanted to ask, he died in Sweden, and they, he, they wanted to bring him back to, to France. So they arranged to have him dug up and to have the, bo the bones brought back. The French ambassador who was responsible for this to Sweden was a man named Turlon, who was a, um, he was a knight of Malta. He was very much a Christian warrior. And he asked, after he, the bones were dug up, he asked the Catholic Church if he could take the right index finger as a relic, as a religious relic. Because for someone like Turlon, this was, anyone who was investigating into the heart of nature was doing a spiritual investigation. Uh, and in fact, at that time, Descartes, uh, after his death, people uh, around Europe did seances to summoning his spirit, seeing him in sort of a quasi-saint-like way. Then his bones are brought through this um, uh, uh, lengthy uh, journey back to Paris. Some are taken, uh, some are stolen. I'll get to that in a minute. But uh, in Paris then, the first generation Cartesians who were, who were kind of like a science cult. They were a bit like the Christians in the catacombs in early Rome <coughs> because uh, among uh, the church powers and the state powers, this thing that they were doing, which we would call science, they called the new philosophy, um, was seen with interest. They saw it as kind of possibly a new tool or weapon. Uh, at the same time, they feared it and thought that it might, uh, it might be an attack on, on their power. Um, so these early Cartesians wanted to gain legitimacy for what they were doing. And one thing they did was they actually used the bones of Descartes in this process. They had them brought back to Paris, and then they did a parade through the streets. And they used the model of the parade of the relics, the bones of Saint Genevieve, who was the patron saint of Paris. Who they did an annual parade through the streets with her bones. And then they, held, they did this with Descartes' bones, 
and they held a series of bank banquets at which they invited all the important people in, in the church and in the state, trying to, I mean, they used his bones for political purposes, to win legitimacy for science as a, as a real undertaking. So that is the first use of these bones that in a way that kind of crosses, bridges this gap between religion and science as people understood it at the time. Um, there are several other stories throughout the next 350 years in which these bones are, are used in a way that, um, that plays with this, this uh, bridge or this division between these two ways of understanding things. And so the book essentially, it, what I do is I write narrative history with kind of, well, with an emphasis on both narrative and history, uh, so that I'm, I, I believe that stories and p the conflicts that people have and that they act out in time are worthwhile. And so having a decided this is going to be my focus, the next thing was, well, follow these stories. Follow the stories of the people who had these bones, who stole them, uh, traded them, passed them down. And as it turns out, so the, the book ends up becoming a series of six or seven stories starting in the 1660s and uh, ending up in about 2000 um, of people who, who possessed the bones of Descartes for one reason or another. And they all tend to have a, a, this central theme of something about uh, faith and reason and either the conflict or their, their interpretation of that. So the next main uh, occurrence is in the, during the French Revolution when the bones of Descartes, uh, during the French Revolution, of course, it was this titanic uh, revolution, not just against the state, but against the church. And uh, there was this great um, uh, sacking of churches throughout the country that was part of it. Uh, and at the same time, a, a new church was being built, which the state requisitioned, and they turned it into the Pantheon, which still exists as a secular temple to, to the French uh, people. And uh, they wanted to put Sec they wanted to use it as a secular sort of place for sort of secular relics. And so they began putting, they put the bones of Voltaire in there, and then came Descartes. And they had this huge debate in the French, uh, in, uh, the French government, the revolutionary government. And it's, it's fascinating reading the journals of it because these people, in effect, stopped history to ponder the significance of Descartes as a progenitor of democracy and so on, and their own role in things. In other words, they backed up and said, all right, what happened in the 1600s? What happened in 1650? And, and how did that lead to where we are now in the 1790s? Uh, and uh, so they, they, were, um, they, they voted, actually, to, to put him, to give him the honors of the Pantheon. But then the terror happened. The reign of terror happened. And you know, half the people who voted for it were, were, were dead uh, shortly thereafter. And so the bones uh, sort of took a detour. Um, and stories like this often have, have a lot of detours in it. Um, in the 19th century, <laughs> Uh, let me back up. The skull was stolen uh, by the person who was guarding it right after the corpse was dug up. And uh, it then follows its own trajectory uh, through history. And in the 19th century, in it, you have the beginnings of the, the field of brain science and the field of uh, comparative anatomy. Uh, one of the features, one of the uh, 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 topics was the, the, relation, the correlation between brain size and intelligence. And it was argued most of all by Georges Cuvier, who was the probably the most important biologist before Darwin, uh, and who was responsible for a lot of the features of of, uh, of biology as we know them, but who had his his flaws. One of which was he was a great proponent of this notion, and he argued and and brought out skulls of great thinkers, which were very large, to support this theory, uh, and. Um, and finally, though, the theory was, you know, the sort of coup de grace or the opposite side was someone found the skull of Descartes. And Descartes was a very small man, and his skull is very small. I've seen it at, at the Musée de l'Homme in Paris. And, uh, you know, he was the <coughs> intellectual father of the French nation, and he had this very tiny skull. So that seemed to thwart, to thwart the notion. Uh, but again, you know, following, you know, using this kind of uh, vehicle to, to, to tell a story, uh, if you allow it to... To, to tell itself, in, in a way, you find that it, it, um, it takes paths that are useful, that are, that are relevant as well. So that, all right, you're talking about uh, you know, the, the development over time of the notions, notions having to do with what science is and what religion is. Well, science is not a neat thing. Science proceeds in kind of a messy way. And even here, in a case like this, in the 1820s, this, this debate went on. 
and then it, this skull of Descartes comes into play and that seems to, to kill this theory. Well, 20 years later, the theory comes back. It has a reemergence, and this time, Cuvier is dead, and his skull is brought in to, 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 to play. And Cuvier had a massive, he had like the largest skull anyone had uh, ever seen. Um, and they had, at that time, they had, um, uh, you know, because the, these uh, French scientist gentlemen were very, very keen on, on uh, uh, doing, using everything you could to advance knowledge, so they, they belonged to an autop autopsy club. So when one of them died, everybody else would kind of, you know, uh, dig in. And uh, so his friends, uh, his friends uh, performed an autopsy. They took out the brain, they weighed it, and so on. And he had this enormous skull, which then, you know, went again to show the other case. Cuvier's, it, Cuvier, I mean, literally, his brain was used to prove his argument that, that in fact, skull size, uh, e it was uh, correlated with intelligence. So these things move um, slowly. Um, let me talk about uh, philosophy. How am I doing on time? Okay. Let me talk about uh, philosophy a little bit because, you know, when you uh, use the word Descartes in the title of a book, you have to talk about philosophy. Um, Descartes, Des among other things, Descartes is credited with or blamed with uh, the development of two things that are related, the mind-body problem and the concept of dualism. Nobody's, like, rushing for the door <laughs> yet. <laughs> um, so, uh, Th th but they're actually, uh, they have very real world, I mean, these are philosophical terms for very ordinary issues. In fact, you might say the most human issue, which is to say, all the time we exist in our minds and in our thoughts, which is a seemingly eternal realm. It's a non-physical realm. We can ponder the thoughts that somebody like Descartes or, or Jesus or whoever it is thought and, and bandied about. And at the same time, we're chained to bodies that that decay and die. And that conundrum is, you could say, why we have art, why, we, uh, why sex thrills us, why, why we do philosophy. Uh, and how to, how to bridge this gap between the mind and the body is al has always been a puzzle for philosophers. And in the 17th century, it was a dangerous thing as well. Because you know the terrain of the mind and the terrain of the body, the the, f the, the physical and the non-physical, and how they come together, uh, had implications for uh, f for churchly power. I mean, the church had terrain had had uh, reign over that. You know, De Descartes and others uh, called the one side, the non-physical side, mind soul. In other words, anything that wasn't physical, and they thought those things were not physical, uh, and. So uh, one area in which this was thorny was the Catholic notion of the host. You know, when a priest uh, blesses a piece of bread during the Mass, the, the bread, I don't know how many are Catholics here, but it doesn't represent, it actually becomes the body of Christ. So the question for a philosopher in the 17th century was, well, you know, it looks like a piece <laughs> of bread. I mean, um, so you had to then try to sort this out, you know, and they had developed, including Descartes, they developed these these ways of trying to be good scientists, but also saying, no, it really, you know, it really does uh, become the body of Christ. And Descartes' explanation, others said, ah, oh, but now you're doing the represent, th represent thing. You're saying, no, it just, it just symbolizes. And then he said, no, 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 it really is underneath. So that was one way of, uh, uh, that, this was, that this was dangerous territory. Um, Descartes then gave a solution to the, the notion of, uh, of the, the mind-body problem and, and this dualism, his solution was to draw a hard line between the two realms and say that these two things exist, these two types of reality exist, but they don't, they're distinct from one another. Uh, and what he was doing partly was he was a, he was a devout Catholic. Uh, actually, there are uh, people are divided on this question. There are three top Descartes scholars in the world today, uh, and they all were nice enough to help me with my book and, and read the <coughs> manuscript and things, and they, and what, this is one of the things I sort of queried them about, and they differ on this question of whether Descartes himself was a devout Catholic or not. Richard Watson, who's the premier American Descartes scholar, thinks he was just paying lip service to the church. Um, uh, the top French Descartes scholar, who also happens to be a priest, thinks that, no, Descartes was, in fact, a good Catholic. I actually think uh, uh, that that was the case, too. So Descartes was trying to protect 
he was trying to cordon off the theological. He was trying to protect the church by saying uh, mind and body are two different things. Therefore, when science, as, it, as it's prying into the physical world, it can't touch the terrain of the church. Now, what people saw even at that time, and what proved to, to be the case over time, was that as science got, was able to explain more and more of reality by focusing on the physical side, the church's uh, uh, the side of, of things got smaller and smaller, and the church became less and less relevant, and people said, well, you know, maybe that's just a bunch of nonsense. So, um, but that was, so that was Descartes' approach to dualism. Uh, he, um, it, it, there, there's a basic problem with his approach, which is, you know, I'm, I'm feeling thirst, which is a physical thing, and I, I see the, the water in front of me, and that, that, and that forms a picture in my mind, and something in my mind transmits a signal to my hand to reach out for the water. I mean, the, you're d always doing this complex dance between these two sides, and his, if there's a hard distinction between the two, how do you account for that? This is the, the great puzzle for, for philosophy that Descartes, um, that Descartes set up, and that the philosophers in one way or another have tried to deal with ever since as a philosophy student, uh, the one theory, the one attempted solution that I was very fond of was called the two clocks theory that said um, you, you want to open the door and the hand reaches out to the knob. Those two things, you know, the, 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 the mental and then the physical, seem to follow the one from the other, but in fact it's like two clocks, a mental clock and a physical clock that are just ticking exactly the same time, you know, which is a very, uh, Bertrand Russell dealt with that, the two clocks theory deftly saying, there were of course difficulties in this theory. In the first place, it was very odd. <laughs> um, so, and f philosophers have ever since, uh, some philosophers since Descartes have noted that the person who is the, you know, the, the father of modern philosophy was in fact a pretty lousy philosopher in that, you know, he couldn't even explain how you get a drink of water. So, uh, so you know, his, his, his attempts had problems. <laughs> He himself realized the, uh, the difficulty with this. Uh, his first attempt at solving it is, was a, a bad one, uh, but it's the one that has gone down in history. And that's the way he, he identified this, uh, something in the brain called the pineal gland and decided because it was the one part of the brain that he could find that was not symmetrical. There was just one right in the middle. And so he decided that must be the place that is the, the bridge, the place where the, the physical and the non-physical come together, the mind and the brain come together. Now immediately people said, wait a second, it, it, the problem is there's a distinction between mind and body, but you've got a physical thing that is the mediator between mind and body, that doesn't make sense. So it really doesn't solve anything. Uh, and he was ridiculed for it. Uh, he did, however, have another solution right near the end of his life, right before he died, which I think is one of the, one of the most um, uh, uh, one of the best attempted solutions of this problem. Um, he, and, and I'll just tell a little story and then I'll stop, he was a vain, irascible, uh, highly ambitious man. Um, he had one known intimate relationship in his life with the housekeeper of someone he was staying with in Amsterdam. Uh, he, and he was enough of a nerd that he, he wrote down the date that they did it. <laughs> and, and nine months later, uh, a daughter was born and uh, uh, her name was Francine, and she was the love of his life. And uh, she lived to the age of five, and then she died of scarlet fever. And this, you know, broke his heart. And this period of time, from sort of this affair through her, his child's death, is a time when his philosophy changed. It, it, it was no longer just focused on, you know, medicine and salt crystals and things, but on, you know, bigger issues as well. And it's also after this time, that he, hit, that he writes this book called The Passions of the Soul. Passions in the 17th century uh, meant emotions. And he hit on the idea that the emotions, that somehow, he said, I don't know that I can under explain this mind-body thing, and I don't know that anybody can, maybe it's beyond us, but somehow the emotions, they work on us physically, and they're also part of our mental <coughs> life. So they are kind of a bridge. And, the, and a top uh, French Descartes scholar said to me that you can think of this solution of his, the emotions are like an encoding that somehow encompasses both realms. And uh, in neuroscience and computer science and so on, I think in various fields today where they're dealing with these things, that, I mean, he was in a way uh, very prescient and foreshadowed a lot of that.
Let me just say one thing very quickly about November 4. Um, uh, I think one reason that, the, that people have, um, have been looking forward so much to this election is that the years of the Bush presidency have coincided, not coincidentally, with, with uh, a rise of fundamentalisms in the world. Muslim fundamentalism, Christian fundamentalism, and then kind of secular atheist uh, fundamentalism, people like Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens writing these books saying, you know, you people are all crazy, let's, uh, you know, we've got to focus on reason and science and civil rights and things like that. Um, the story of Descartes' bones op over the past four centuries of modernity shows repeatedly this, this same cycle where fun these fundamentalisms come into play come, uh, and come into conflict with one another. But there's one, uh, one other thing, and in the book I'm re I rely on the work of the historian Jonathan Israel, who says that in fact there weren't two dividing camps in modernity, two divided camps, uh, the sort of theological party and the, uh, the Enlightenment party. In fact, the Enlightenment party was split in two. There was the radical Enlightenment, which said religion is the old stuff, we now know, we now know better. Uh, so let's push that away and, and move forward. And then there was what he calls the moderate enlightenment camp, which said part of the job of reason is to understand and appreciate the irrational in, in us. Uh, and uh, he and others point out in the, the, the represent representations of these two parties in the French Revolution, which was a, a radical revolution in terms of pushing away religion, and the American Revolution, which allowed it and allowed it and found a way for, for it to work Within within something that was that was completely new, so um, so I think that in a way we've been longing for a way out of this sort of clash of fundamentalisms and towards uh, sort of a return to the moderate enlightenment. I'll leave it there and be happy to take questions. Yes, sir. thank you very much. <laughs> It took me, uh, how long did it take to write? I, I should probably repeat questions, right? Um, uh, it took me, it's always hard to say. I started, I think, in 2003, and really got going somewhere in 2004, and then really got going in 2005, um, so probably three years. Um, I, I based myself in Amsterdam, that's when I first moved there, uh, <coughs> because Descartes had spent most of his career in the Dutch uh, provinces and also because I knew a lot of historians and there from working on my last book, and that was a good base. And the Dutch are very open, sort of intellectually. You can go into any library and g you can get access to anything. And, and uh, so I just made trips to Paris and to Sweden and, and other places. Yes, Stephen? Yeah, do I find that it's helpful to be in the historical place? I think it's very helpful, um, and not necessarily in ways you can put your finger on, but you know, you're also, you, you have to find ways to kind of kickstart yourself and energize yourself and, and, and discover you know, and, and, and you know, unlock creativity and things like that, and being there, being there helps. And then, of course, you, you discover other things that are maybe useful, like they were digging, actually this is an example that isn't in the book, but somehow, but they were digging the canals of Amsterdam during the time that, he, that Descartes was there. And this was a city that was very much, uh, the canals are kind of like tentacles or arms that reach out around the world because the Dutch Empire was reaching all around the world. So, you know, you, can, you get a sense of that place at that time uh, and how that may have, must have affected, how that must have related to, to what he was doing. So in, in, in nonlinear ways, you know, it affects things too. Yes. What's your next project? My next project, uh, I'm not sure, but I may actually write a book about Amsterdam, <laughs> which um, <laughs> my last book was about, the previous book was about the Dutch founding of, of Manhattan, of New Amsterdam. And I've been si in living in Amsterdam, I'm seeing a lot of connections between the two cities. And Amsterdam now is a place where the struggle between, you know, uh, immigrants and the, and the native culture, and, and Islam and Christianity and secularism, these three fundamentalisms, if you want to say it that way, uh, uh, that are at play now. It's, it's a very interesting place. It's a very small place, and, it's, and those forces are playing out uh, quite intensely. So I think there's something in there that's, uh, 
that's, uh, I you know, the, in writing something that's a history that's also kind of mixes present day color and that sort of thing. That's what I'm thinking about. Yeah, sure. So you had to pick one, I guess, modern thing that you'd like to be alive 100 years from now to write about. As an uh, well, that's a tricky question. So you're saying <laughs> if I lived 100, so if I had to pick one thing uh, 100 years from now that I would come back now and write about, so that 100 years from now I wouldn't be able to be there for, right. but in fact I am here for. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, uh, that's really. That's really tricky. Well, I guess I would say that's why I'm a journalist also, <laughs> because you get to write about things that are going on now. So. Yes? Uh, I'm not so familiar with your writing for New York Magazine. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about what you specifically write about and whether it belongs to you? What do I write about for the, yeah, I write for the New York Times Magazine, and uh, I usually write long uh, cover stories, which are long features. Um, the last one was about, since I'm in Europe, I'm writing about European topics. Um, and the last one was about the low birth rate in Europe. You know, in the Western European countries, particularly in the Southern European countries, uh, their birth rate is like 1, 1.1, 1 1.2, and uh, 2.1 is considered the replacement rate. Uh, and uh, so, you know, there's all this fear that Italy and Spain and Greece, they're basically... Sorry? Yeah, this was uh, a couple months ago I wrote that. Yeah. He read it, so there. <laughs> um, and uh, so that's... You know, at the, in terms of like pension systems and so on, that has an effect. But also culture. I mean, is you know, 30 years from now you go to Italy and nobody's making pasta anymore. I mean, you know, and also it, Europe's influence in the world. Uh, Europe was, I think, uh, now I'm forgetting the statistics. I think it was 10% of the world's population, and now it's like 6% of the world's population. So you know, its relevance, its importance, and and uh, has all sorts of ramifications. So I write about uh, European topics, uh, and I also have written a lot about sort of what I think of as Descartes' bones in the world now, um, about uh, uh, American Christian conservatives uh, trying to stop gay marriage and trying to limit uh, contraception and things like this. And in fact, I was with a group in, of uh, uh, Christian activists in Maryland uh, who were working against gay marriage in that state. And the, the one, this minister actually said to me, you know, when you think about it, it all starts with Descartes. And I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I put that in the book, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. So you said there was a cycle of fundamentalism and tolerance, and, you know, it goes back and forth. Uh, is there a good way out of that cycle? Like, is there a good way out of the rising fundamentalism that leads to a more reasonable... Do I have to repeat your question, or are you on a mic? <laughs> <laughs> is there a good way out of the fundamentalisms? Well, I think, it, you know, if... If people, if enough people are tired of the idea that, you know, that the black and white thinking results in disaster, results in mutual annihilation or something like that, then you can begin to see a way forward. And as I said, if you look at this over the past 350 years, really, you see this interplay between those uh, kind of three camps. And there are times when people, when the, when the two fundamentalist camps are really locked, locking horns, and then people get tired of, tired of bloodshed, and they try to, and they long for something else. And I think it seems to be human nature that that's what it takes. You know, you just have to be exhausted by it. Go back to what? Bloodshed. bloodshed. Yeah, I mean that seems to be the way, the way we work. Not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you all very much this was thank fun you. thanks